Presented by Historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It seemed like such a random thing at the time, when Matthias had been told to go along with everyone who was going out to hear this new preacher from Nazareth. There was nothing especially compelling stopping him from going that particular day, so he went. Then, after that chance encounter with the gracious words of Jesus, words dripping with compassion, grace, and authority, Matthias had the good luck of continuing to hear this teacher, following him on his speaking tour, learning more and more with every sermon, with every unfolding of the scriptures, until Matthias suddenly found himself being sent out with the group of 71 other disciples who had sat at the feet of the Lord. Then, Matthias had happened to be in Jerusalem for the trial and death of Jesus, and then for his resurrection and ascension. He was, by chance, with the 120 believers gathered together afterward as they discussed the need to replace Judas and fill the number of the apostles. And then, Matthias, out of everyone, stood beside Joseph, called Barsabbas, also called Justice. And after praying, they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, naming him one of the apostles, so that the number would once again be twelve, the number of fullness and completion. And all of this, because of the string of events in his life, that had seemed like so much happenstance. It seems that so much of life is random chance. So much of what we are and what we do is a result of being in the right place at the right time. The people that we spend our lives with are a matter of who we're born to, who our siblings are, both things outside of our control and then meeting the right person at the right moment. Our personalities, physical appearance, and health, we are told, is mostly a matter of random alignment of genes. And this, when we combine with circumstance, makes up our histories. It's not really in our control. It all seems to be chance, luck, coincidence, or, as the ancients called it, fortune. Yet, we struggle and fight against it so much, don't we? We all take on the yoke of trying to control things. And what a heavy yoke it is. We carry the weight of trying to control every detail, every twist and turn of fate, create a plan B for every situation. We fight against the steady stream of events that are outside of our sphere of influence, raging and struggling, trying to bring everything to heel under our reign. And what does this gain us? How many of us, by worrying about what someone else is doing, by hurling lightning and insults and plots and schemes, can add one hour to our lives. Indeed, if anything, this heavy yoke shows how deadly it is by increasing stress and shortening our time on this earth. Or how many of us, by trying to manipulate and control every aspect of not only our existence, but everyone else around us, can change one hair on our head from white to black? Indeed, very often the opposite occurs. We want to control everything, every chance, every event, because in our hearts, 
we have the same flaw that was in the hearts of our ancestors, Adam and Eve. We desire to be like God. We don't trust God to make the right decisions. Not with our lives. We want to make sure that we've pulled all the strings we can so that everything works to our benefit, whatever the ever-changing definition of benefit might mean to us at that particular time. We want to say what's good or evil, what's right and wrong. We want to control every aspect of life. We struggle, and we try to carry this burden that we create for ourselves, but ultimately, we fail. There's not much that we can actually control. Even the unbelieving philosophers can teach us that. We can't control the flow of time. We can't govern our own bodies, not truly, not in the long run. We can't dictate the behavior of others, no matter how much we decree and legislate. We wear ourselves out and burden ourselves with the weight of the world, or at least the weight of our corner of the world. And all this because our trust in God is wanting. Because we don't believe that he'll take care of us. That we must take care of ourselves. Jesus sees us struggling under this weight, this defiance of how things are and will be. And so he replies, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. His yoke is lighter than what we've been trying to carry on our own when we try to be our own gods and control our own little worlds. He takes that weight upon himself. He bears the weight of taking care of our needs. He has the yoke of looking to our welfare. He carries the enormous burden of controlling every little detail, even the casting of lots, so that things will work for the good of those who love him. The Lord directs all things so that his word will go out and save his people. Today is the feast of St. Matthias the last apostle added to that holy band. The apostle added by the casting of lots. We need only look at his life to see the Lord directing all things so that this would happen. It may seem that it was all random chance, being in the right place at the right time, the balance and tilt of the dice that led to Matthias' selection as an apostle, but in truth, It was directed by the Lord of all. Chance and luck, those are just names for the times when we can't see exactly how the Lord is directing and governing. When we don't understand the sequence of events that he is using to lead to that outcome. God leaves nothing up to random chance when it comes to his beloved children. And so he orchestrates everything for the, for the good of those who he has made his own in baptism. And the same can be said of your life. How many times in your life have you had something work out? Even when it looked like it couldn't. Even when it looked like there was no way that it should. Now, I'm not talking about finding a good parking spot or having impeccable timing so that you enjoy sunshine and miss out on rain for a picnic or something like that. Nor am I talking about looking for some kind of meaning or looking in to see the entire divine will of God through one or two random acts. No, I'm talking about hearing a word of God that was perfectly timed, 
exactly when you needed to hear it. I'm talking about hearing from a friend, your family, a loved one, right when you needed to. I'm talking about having daily bread, something that you truly needed, not just something you wanted, but needed, given right into your hands through ways that you didn't see coming. That's your Heavenly Father directing all the events of the world, bending them to care for you, governing every electron and every biochemical reaction every rise and fall of empires so that he can look out for you, to work for your eternal good, to make sure that his word goes out to you. After all, this is what he did in the earthly life of his son. Who would have ever guessed that the coronation of an emperor, Caesar Augustus, thousands of miles away from Nazareth, would lead to the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, so that the roads were safe enough for a carpenter and his wife to travel safely to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of the Messiah's birth in the city of David. Or that the appointment of an indifferent governor, Pontius Pilate, would lead to the crucifixion of an innocent man, a death that would be the payment for the sins of the world. Who would have foreseen the sequence of seemingly random events that would lead to fishermen proclaiming the death and resurrection of that man, Jesus, for the salvation of all? Who would have predicted the way that that saving word went out among the poor and sick, the outcasts, underground and illegal, and yet still turn the world upside down? The Lord directs all things so that his word will go out. And what does that word accomplish when it's gone out? What's the eternal good that's done when it reaches the ears of those who need it? It forgives sins. It gives forgiveness for those times when you tried to take the reins and control the universe when you tried to be Lord and God of your own life. It gives forgiveness for viewing your God with suspicion and accusing Him of seeking your harm. It grants forgiveness for doubt, for thoughts, words, and deeds that were against His will, against the way that He was governing everything. It's His Word that forgives. His Word when it's spoken. His word that delivers the word made flesh, that gives that flesh and, blood, flesh and blood word to you here and now at the altar. And that word gives eternal life. Forgiveness leads to being in his presence forever, cleansed and purified from every flaw and stain. So it gives eternal joy, the easiest and lightest of all yokes. It gives resurrection of the body, the restoration of every cell, every nerve, every sense, when the body that God created for you is risen from the dead and made perfect. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls." For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is a light yoke to learn that the Lord of all has established everything so that his word will do what he sent it out to do. It is an easy yoke to know that he's doing all the work to bring you to himself, to bring you to his kingdom, to give you rest for your soul to reveal the Father and the Son to you and to make you his little child and reveal his love to you. This is what he did for his servant, St. Matthias. This is what he does for you, his servant, his saint, for whom he governs and directs all things in heaven 
and on earth. In the name of Jesus, who reigns over all. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.